Hi, everyone, and welcome back. I'm Krista Clark with ArtisticVegan.com, and it is my pleasure to bring on Laura Theodore today. Laura Theodore is a nationally recognized television personality, podcast radio host, celebrity, PBS vegan chef, renowned jazz singer, and award-winning author of five plant-based cookbooks, including Jazzy Vegetarian, Deliciously Vegan, which won silver medals at the 2018 IBPA Benjamin Franklin Awards, Midwest Book Awards, and the 2019 Living Now Book Awards. Her highly anticipated new cookbook, Vegan for Everyone, 160 Family-Friendly Recipes with a Delicious Modern Twist, was released by Scribe Publishing Company in March 2020. Season 8 of the Jazzy Vegetarian Television Show airs nationally every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Create channel. Check your local listings. And Laura's new podcast, Jazzy Vegetarian Radio, airs live every Thursday on Unity Online Radio. You can learn more at jazzyvegetarian.com. Welcome to the show, Laura. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you so much. What a wonderful uh, introduction. I love that. And I had a blast having you on my podcast two weeks ago. Oh, I had a really great time too. Thank you so much for having me on. It was a true pleasure. Could you tell yeah. us about Thank your... You. Yeah, I really liked your podcast. And I've actually started, I've listened to it. I found it on Spotify. So that's, that's nice. That bonus. <laughs> um, could oh, you good. I love it. Thanks. Yeah. Could you tell us about your journey into becoming a vegan and, and what did it look like for you? Well, I guess it's kind of an interesting one because back when I first started hearing about vegetarianism, which is um, a long, long time ago, uh, you know, there, there just wasn't much out there, even if you were trying to be a vegetarian. In other words, there were little stores with big, big barrels that had rice in them and grains in them and, you know, a few things in the store and uh, tofu still was not in septic packages. Uh, it would just be in water sitting in the store. I mean, that's that's where my journey started. So it was really kind of cloudy, to say the least. Sure. And then moving over into veganism, as I finally realized that there was certainly a, uh, a connection between animal cruelty and eggs and milk, etc., things that actual vegetarians often still, still eat. Um, so I decided to become vegan, and my husband's vegan, and that was kind of challenging because when we started out, you know, once again, there were not a lot of vegan options. Vegan cheese was, you know, few and far between to find. You still could only get vegan milk in the aseptic packages. It was not in the refrigerated section at grocery stores yet. Mm -hmm. So that's really how the Jazzy Vegetarian was born because I realized that, oh gosh, if I'm having this challenge, everybody else must be having this challenge too. Right. And I know your listeners are asking, as I'm asked all the time, well, why the heck is it called Jazzy Vegetarian then? We you know, started this brand because we wanted to parlay into television, which is my husband's background, and I was a child actor, so that was a comfortable background for me. Oh, interesting. And at the time... The word vegan was still not a word that people knew of. And sure. vegetarian at the time was considered to be vegan. So that's how that whole thing came about. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, that's really interesting. When did you first decide to share your path of veganism with the community? And, um, and when did the jazzy, the jazzy vegetarian first be, when did it first, when was it first born? Sorry, I couldn't get it out. <laughs> when was it born? Yeah, that's, that's a good one. Well, it, I, let's see. Now I started watching, I guess the Food Network, which is a channel on, uh, you know, mm -hmm. cable television mm -hmm. here in the United States. I think it was started in around 1999 and I started watching it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in my mind, I'm watching the recipes and I'm converting everything to be, uh, you know, to be vegan. Sure. And, and at the time, I, I think I still, I don't know, I hadn't been eating cheese and stuff, but I would think about vegetarian, but, but mostly trying to convert everything to vegan versions. 
And then I started realizing, well, wait a minute, they don't have any vegan show on here. So I really started studying the network over a period of years and realized that, gosh, this is something I would really feel comfortable. I'd really like to do. I think that I could do a great job communicating vegan recipes because I'm comfortable in front of the camera. I have fantastic vegan recipes, which I know we'll talk about later on in the show. Yeah. And so I started on the path, well, let's do something about it. So my husband and I were kind of saying, well, what should we call this? You know, what, what, what's a name that would make sense? We were kind of goofing around. We said, well, you're a jazz artist. You have a whole bunch of jazz albums out. Um, you know, you're vegetarian. How about the jazzy vegetarian? And a couple of days later, I walked into my office, and all of a sudden the jingle came into my head. <laughs> and really, the jazzy vegetarian was born. Wow. And it was around... I guess 2008 that I decided a podcast was going to be a great way to go. I started the podcast and that parlayed into books and that parlayed into a television show. And that's how we, we got going with it. Wow. That's fantastic. That's great. And now you've been able to reach so many wonderful people with your recipes and helping so many others, you know, that have these challenges themselves. That's wonderful. Was that was it- the idea behind it because Yeah. Well, you know, we used to live in New York City. So when I lived in New York, I would walk three, four blocks, and I would be able to get anything I wanted Mm -hmm. vegan, anything. Mm -hmm. And this was, you know, 20 years ago. And so when we moved out of the city, and we moved into a suburb of New York, and this was, uh, I guess, 17 years ago or so, I I was like, oh, my gosh. I can't get that stuff anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, there must shift. be a lot of people that have the same challenge. And that's really where I thought, okay, this is how this can parlay into a television show, into helping people. Because if I'm having this challenge, everybody must be having this challenge. Right. And that's really been my mission since day one, you know, helping people, whether they just want to be plant-based one day a week, or if they want to pursue it for their full-time diet, whatever they want to do, anything in between, helping with any kind of information that I can uh, through bringing on, you know, guests on my podcast and my television show and writing the books. And that's really been my mission from day one. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, we kind of went through the same culture shock. We, we, we can went from San Diego, California, where you could get everything that you wanted, anything, anything and everything, you know, you could go to this health food store, or that health food store, or, you know, a different nationality store, and then going to Mexico, and it was such a shock. There was, there, veganism really hasn't caught wind down here yet. <laughs> and so you're slowly starting, you have to go to a special store to find tofu or order things online. So it's, it's been a big uh, transition for us too, <laughs> moving that way. So I'm sure it yeah, affects a yeah. lot of people that live in more rural communities or that don't live in the city. I agree. I agree yeah. 100%. What was, uh, what would you say, what was your first television recording like for the network versus um, just your last season? Uh, was, it, was your first time really scary or was it not because you had had done child acting or what was it like? Oh, thanks. That's, that's an interesting question. Well, um, you know, With public television, we produce our shows. You know, we control the content. And then it's distributed by all of the public television uh, distributors, uh, such as PBS, as you know, the Create Network, American Public Television, and our individual distributor is NETA. And uh, so it's a very, very different process than recording something or producing a show for a network or a table cable uh, company or a cable network. And so since we're producing our own show, my husband comes from television production. I come from uh, acting on television. Um, I had to kind of figure out a way to do the scripting and the transitions, et cetera, et cetera. And that was a little bit challenging at first, but it really was a pretty comfortable uh, process. And my mother, who had always been helping me with all my television stuff since I was a little girl, she flew in and and kind of helped with the first few episodes. And we figured out together how to uh, put the recipe scripting for camera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's blossomed. I mean, it's definitely grown, but it's basically the same process we did in season one. It's just that it's 
pretty much every season except for a few early seasons is in a different venue each season. And now for season eight, we're really excited because we finally have a place, a home that we own. And we actually film out of our home kitchens, which makes it a lot easier oh, than uh, trying to move too. into a studio every time. Sure. Yeah. 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 Much, Run, much better. Running back and forth or forgot this or that. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's great. Et cetera. Uh, well, when we were in New Jersey and we were filming in various uh, cooking school or cooking oh. venues, uh, one season we were in Wolf um, Sub-Zero, a huge showroom. Uh, three seasons we were in the Viking Cooking School. The first season we were in uh, King Super Supermarket. They had a cooking school, a very nice uh, studio there. But uh, the first season in we, we had, they had a lot of things that we needed in the studio, but the subsequent seasons we actually were starting off with almost uh, empty studios, so we had to bring in truckloads oh, of wow. camera equipment, uh, you know, cooking equipment. Mm -hmm. It's a, and still is to this day, even here, it's a six-day setup. I think the least we've ever done it is at four days, but it's four to six days to set up the uh, studio setup and mm -hmm. then a long, uh, you know, tear down afterwards. So it's a, it's a very long process getting the show up and running. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I love your, uh, you know, your studio or your kitchen. It's very comforting and inviting. <laughs> I like, I like what you've done with this. Thank I, you. I'm, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. A lot of that is thanks to our brand partners who I, I'm going to give a shout out to Carpe Diem Hardware who did the beautiful stainless steel handles for our cabinets and American mm -hmm. Standard gave us the beautiful sink and the faucet and April Connell provided all the beautiful, um, you know, uh, the linens and the placemats and all the stuff that makes the food look all so snappy and oh, yeah. OXO and Vitamix and Tasha chocolate and Melissa's produce. And they all help to make it look really colorful and really, really beautiful. So um, I want to give a shout out to them and thank them too. Yeah. Yeah. It's very nice. Well, you've written five cookbooks, right? And what, is there one special cookbook yes. that you enjoyed writing the most? And if so, why? Well, that's kind of like asking, do you have a favorite pet? Or a, a, favorite child. Child? <laughs> yeah. you know? a child. Yeah, you're all unique. Yeah, you love them all. <laughs> I do, I do. But I will say that usually it's the one that I'm just closest to because sure. I, that's in my head the most. And sure. at this point, of course, it's vegan for everyone. And I will say vegan for everyone probably is kind of the thing that's closest to my heart because – uh, many of the recipes are fan favorites from earlier cookbooks of mine that I have updated or we did new photos for or we felt that, you know, people that were new to the Jazzy Vegetarian would love these recipes. Mm -hmm. So those are all recipes that are near and dear to my heart. And then all of the new recipes are ones that have been uh, created and tested over probably the last 10 years. I mean, I had been saving a lot of good stuff and oh, awesome. doing all the photography. I do a lot of the photography myself now, which I really, really love. And it makes it kind of control what the recipe is going to look like and the outcome. So I think Begin for Everyone is probably my favorite. And each cookbook is done over a very long period of time. Uh, there's a wonderful, wonderful team at Scribe Publishing, uh, all the editors and the proofreaders. And then we've got a uh, great designer, uh, John Winkeck over at Aero, Aero Charter, uh, book designing. And we all work together to really make the book really pop. And I'm, yeah. I'm happy about this one because it's cheerful. It's mm -hmm. colorful. It's beautiful. It's really, really comprehensive. I mean, it's kind of, you know, you have a book in your head, and then sometimes that book in your head does not look quite like that book on paper. And this <laughs> book was the book in my head looks exactly like I wanted it to look like. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, it's really beautiful. I was pretty excited when I got mine and I love the hardcover and the colors and the pictures really pop. And, you know, the recipes are great. I've been using them. So that's always a plus. <laughs> the most important part. Huh? Recipes. Yeah, <laughs> recipes are important. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> so do you have like a, a, a particular cookbook or a food experience or a food network show that influenced your path and um, kind of brought your passion to share cooking to life or no? No, I do. It's a couple of things. 
I mean, part of it is I started cooking when I was really young oh, cool. uh, with my grandmother on a stool in her kitchen making the oh. yearly applesauce with her with the apples from her tree. And I guess that was when I was about three years old. So I've always been interested in cooking. And my mother was great with giving me tips and helping me with cooking from a very early age as well. And and, and actually, my grandmother's last name, my mother's maiden name was Cook. Oh, wow. <laughs> so yeah. it, was, it was destiny. So it, it was kind of like <laughs> in the foreseeable future for me. Uh, but what really influenced me, as I said earlier, is yeah, seeing the shows on the Food Network and mm-hmm. saying, hey, you know, I want to do that. They're not doing anything like it. And then seeing uh, Christina, Christina Cook, so I want to give a big shout out to her. Oh, I like she her, yeah. She started her vegan oh, show. Her. Yeah, she's great. And I think she started her first uh, show on public television uh, in the early 2000s. And, uh, you know, I feel like she has a voice. I have a voice. We mm-hmm. complement one another because she has a certain style of cooking. I have a different style of cooking. So she really influenced me because when I saw, oh, hey, she's doing it. This is something that's possible to do. Yeah. And so that really influenced me. And then as far as other shows on public television, I was very inspired by Lydia Bastianich, even though, she, of course, she's not vegan. She's Italian. So she showcases a lot of Uh, vegetable dishes on Mm -hmm. her program and the way that she has a passion for her food the way that they structured her show I was really influenced by that and her um, just the electricity of her on-camera persona really was something that uh, it 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 gave me an idea of how I wanted to present my show so kind of those three things combined came together to make what the jazzy vegetarian is as far as the structure of the show is concerned. Yeah, I find that even if it's not vegan, sometimes I'll watch the Italian ones too for the, I, I like it too, the energy and the food. And like you said, a lot of vegetable sides and, and you can easily switch this or that. <laughs> so it's, yeah, I, I like There's that no too. doubt. I mean, I, I, one of the biggest things that uh, influences me is trying to take a meat centric recipe and making it vegan, because I think that's what people really want. I mean, I know that's what my husband wants when I'm <laughs> entertaining people, if I ever can entertain people again, but that's a whole other different subject. Sure. But, you know, when people are coming over to eat, uh, 99% of the time, they're not vegan. So I'm trying to make a recipe that is going to be set in front of them, and they're not going to say, oh, gosh, what is this big pile of mush? Right. You know, I want to have it that... You know, I love to serve a vegan meatloaf or a shish kebab or a pasta recipe or even a chili recipe, something that when I put it in front of people, it looks familiar. And the best way in my mind to do that is I love taking recipes, you know, like the Betty Crocker cookbook. That's a great inspiration. All these recipes are inspirations and saying, okay, what do I substitute for the eggs? What do I substitute Mm -hmm. for the meat? What do I substitute for the cream? And that's, that's how my mind works. Like a jazz singer mind works when you're scatting and you're going around the chords. It's the same kind of concept as far as how you use your creativity and kind of how your brain waves work, I guess. Yeah. And And I I think you can train it. it. Yeah. I think you can train it after, you know, so many years of doing it. Um, My, my brain certainly works that way too. It's like, I don't look at it as something I can eat. How can I eat it? (laughs) Exactly. And that's what I love about your cookbook too. And, and, and your recipes, it's all very centered around, okay, this is something that folks are accustomed to seeing on their plates and this is how I can make it look and taste really inviting. And they're not going to miss the dairy products. They're not going to miss the meat. And right. I think that's where you and I are really, you know, simpatico in that way. Sure. Absolutely. How would you say that um, sharing your path with the community, how have you seen, how, how have you seen it helped you blossom as a woman? Hmm. Well, really for me, it is, the joy that I get every day of folks that are either new to the program, new to the blog, new to the website, new to the books, new to the podcast, and they say, you've helped me in whatever way it may be. 
um, someone that says, you've helped me, I've lost 50 pounds, I feel better. Mm -hmm. You've helped me, my granddaughter or my daughter is vegan, I didn't know what to cook them. Right. You've helped me, my husband has a heart condition, and I now know what to make them for dinner. Yeah. Uh, you've helped me because I wanted to be vegan, but I didn't know how to do it, and your recipes are really accessible. These are the things that have given me the confidence and given me happiness in moving from being a full-time jazz singer and actor over into a whole different life path. Yeah. And I can continue to use that creativity, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, that I would use in singing. And of course, I still I sing on the program, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I really love the way that has helped me to diversify the way that I live and the way that I think, because that really helps me to feel like I'm doing something to help the world in a tiny little way every day. Absolutely. Let's say in a big way. And you also even host a podcast. And what's your favorite part of hosting the podcast each week? It's the joy of having wonderful guests. Um, you know, it, it's a big task producing a live one hour podcast every week, as you, as you know, and can imagine. Sure. And uh, so it's, it's a lot of time and a lot of effort. And that part of it, some part of it I really like and some part of it uh, not so much. Some mm -hmm. part of it feels really pressurous knowing that I have to uh, keep people um, involved in the show and make it something enticing that they want to listen to because there's so many podcasts out there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, writing the full hour-long script every week. That's challenging, but it's a good kind of challenging. But the biggest and the most wonderful thing is all the fabulous guests like yourself that come mm -hmm. on and learning from them and helping to spread their word as well and being able to, on a weekly basis, uh, give new information, which of course is unlike the television show, but to give new information, up-to-date information to all of the listeners every single week. So it's a different kind of up that I get from it, a different kind of satisfaction because it's uh, communicating, you know, things that people want to hear in the here and now. And of course, with the television yeah. show, by the time it premieres, it was already recorded eight months prior to that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of a, it's a different way, but that's what I get out of the podcast. I, I think it's just a, a wonderful way to help people get out there. And particularly now, everybody needs to learn more about healthy eating more than ever, pretty much in the history of the world. Yeah. And so it's, it's a great thing to be doing. Yeah. And, and it's kind of a form of, of gathering, even virtually, you know, by listening to someone else's conversation through a podcast, you kind of feel like, oh, I'm, you know, something in there might be for you, or you might get a little something out of it. I agree. Interestingly enough, a friend of mine emailed me yesterday, and I was saying, you know, how's she doing? And we have talk for a while it says she says well I feel like you're with me all the time because I listen to the podcast every <laughs> week and so it is it's, it's a great way to keep connected I agree yeah well you recently published your beautiful new book vegan for everyone and I, I really love it congratulations it really turned out nice and I really like the great recipes and there's tons of gluten-free options if, if you're gluten-free and you're concerned there's a lot of um, either recipes that are gluten-free or there's the gluten-free option on on the recipe that's not and then you also have information on how to stock your pantry and your spice rack as well as how to eat a balanced diet ensuring that you get the nutrients required which I, I liked that section that was nice and uh, well the whole book's great but would you mind going over the essentials for your spice rack I thought that might be a nice thing to go over right now since people since we're kind of in uh, this quarantine this tough time and um, having different spices to pull from can really make a difference in your meal I agree with you, and I, I believe that from day one. I mean, the bottom line, any kind of cooking that you're doing, you want to layer those flavors, but I believe that truly comes into play when you are practicing plant-based or, of course, vegan, uh, particularly with gluten-free cooking. It all depends on layering those flavors, 
And it does not have to be difficult. In other words, you don't have to use a lot of different spices in order to make a recipe look good or taste good. I know a lot of folks, I get a lot of emails and posts on Facebook. Gosh, I couldn't believe the recipe had so much flavor and there were you know, hardly any herbs and spices in it. It's really balancing those herbs and spices. Mm -hmm. And once again, layering them through your process of cooking. You don't have to just dump it all in at the beginning. You want to put it in, okay, you're going to saute your onions. You're going to have some of your spices or your herbs then. Mm -hmm. uh, dried, of course, if, if you're going to put them in that time of cooking. And then when you start adding your ingredients, each time I add ingredients, I often and usually add more layers of that flavor. And mm -hmm. that's what makes the flavors developed, once again, particularly in vegan cooking. The other thing I like to do is to use pre-mixed seasonings. Mm. I use them probably about 80% of the time. Uh, All-purpose blend or Italian seasoning blend. Um, in the new book, I have my recipe for Italian seasoning blend. In mm -hmm. Deliciously Vegan, I have the recipe for Italian seasoning blend and my all-purpose seasoning. Also for my mom's pumpkin pie spice, which I couldn't make it any better than that. So that's in there. <laughs> and um, having chili powder. So there are certain blends that I yeah. think are really important. And then, you know, people will say, well, you know, how do you make it so it really is going to taste good or this or this or that? You think about it. If you're cooking, like you're saying, and we're kind of stressed out a little bit about our cooking right now, let's, let's face it. Mm -hmm. or you, and you're cooking for your whole family and you're trying to make it taste good and you are a little bit short on time, uh, or yet, or you really want your cleanup to be less, one of the main things you can do is, once again, I'm going to give an example, Italian seasoning blend. Well, instead of pulling out basil, uh, garlic powder, marjoram, oregano, sage, parsley, rosemary, I could go on and on and on. And having all these bottles out on the counter, you mm -hmm. take one bottle, put it on the counter, you put it back right there. Oh, to me, that's sense. like a 10 minute savings in time. So it's something that you really want to do. Get a nice Italian seasoning blend, mm -hmm. whether it be my recipe, whether it be a recipe you get off the internet, whether it be a blend. Uh, there's a couple of blends I like. I just buy them at, at the uh, grocery store. I sure. get them online. Same thing with an all-purpose seasoning blend. Always have them on hand. So all-purpose seasoning. And then as far as dried herbs and spices, if I had to do my top 10, which I did in Deliciously Vegan, I think the top 10 would be basil, black pepper, of course. I'm not going to count that as a the salt and pepper goes without saying. But mm -hmm. basil, cayenne pepper, chili powder, cinnamon, uh, cumin, garlic powder, uh, smoked paprika, a pumpkin pie spice, a good one, crushed red pepper flakes, and crushed rosemary, and, of course, turmeric. Mm -hmm. And then other ones that I like to have are cumin, it's like dill weed, garam masala, oh, yeah. marjoram, mm -hmm. oregano, mm -hmm. you know, of course, your sea salt. And those are the basics that I like to have and keep in rotation. Because yeah. with those uh, 15, I think it is, you can really keep the flavors. You can really keep laying around flavors. You can really make incredible food. Once again, when you look at a recipe, I think my biggest tip uh, for this part of the conversation is when you're looking at a recipe and you see, you know, 20 ingredients and 10 of those ingredients are all a mixture of herbs and spices, that doesn't, it makes the recipe look really impressive, but it doesn't necessarily make the recipe taste better. So that's a great jazzy tip. Yeah, that is. That is. That's great. Great advice. And I love the advice of um, pre-mixing your seasonings together instead of having to get a quarter teaspoon at a time in the rosemary of the oregano and just have an Italian seasoning. That makes a lot of sense. And my husband would love that tip. He's an engineer, so he likes, you know, streamlining. <laughs> so that's great. Um, and I wanted to it's say... It's a really good idea. So. Oh, yeah. It just makes sense. Um, that makes sense. I, I must compliment you on your vegan burgers. Um, I personally can't get enough of them. I really love the texture and the way they hold together. And to me, you have a secret method that really changes the game. And your mushroom nut burgers uh, are really delicious. 
And then we recently had your red bean burgers, and those were also really, really fantastic and really easy to make together. And I love that they're baked, and it didn't have a, a lot of ingredients, and it still had really great flavors. So I thought this would be a really good recipe for us during quarantine. Would you mind sharing that recipe with us? I would love to. I love that recipe. And, you know, I think the thing for now is that we want to try to have as many recipes that are based in mostly pantry staples as we possibly can. And that recipe is uh, based mostly in pantry staples, um, with exception of the zucchini, which I will, I'm going to give a substitution for. But they're really moist. Um, great use of red beans. Of course, right now, if you only have cannellini beans or white beans, even black beans. Uh, if you have pinto beans, you could substitute them in the recipe. Of course, it's going to make the texture slightly different, but they're really, really good. Mm -hmm. And you just start off with one and a half tablespoons plus two teaspoons of extra virgin olive oil. You can use any oil that you really prefer uh, that is a neutral tasting oil. But I love the olive oil. I love the fruity little bite that it adds to recipes. And I use Papa Vince for that, by the way. I love that olive oil. And then one can, 15 to 16 ounces of your red kidney beans. You want to drain them and rinse them. Three tablespoons of ketchup. A half a teaspoon of smoked paprika. That is in my top 10 of spice rack essentials because the smoked paprika is what is going to give it kind of that meaty back flavor. So it's an important one. And if you can't get it, in your grocery store or your supermarket right now, it's easy to order online. Quarter teaspoon of salt, and then one and a half cups of freshly ground vegan whole grain breadcrumbs from about three large slices. You can certainly use gluten-free bread for this if you want, and that works really well. That's gonna to help to bind the recipe together. A lot of folks use dried breadcrumbs in their burgers, and if you wanna think about it, if you put dried breadcrumbs into your hand, they're just going to, you open your hand, they're just going to fall out. Mm -hmm. You put fresh ground breadcrumbs into your hand, you close your hand around it, same thing. It's going to bind together. It's going to do the same thing for your burger. And then a half a cup of quick cooking rolled oats. If you want to make it gluten-free, you can use uh, you know, gluten-free quick cooking rolled oats. And you can use just the plain old-fashioned rolled oats. You're just going to have some bigger chunks of oats in your burger. And then four tablespoons of firmly packed shredded zucchini. If you don't have zucchini, you can also use shredded carrots. You could use shredded onion in a pinch. It's going to take, make it taste pretty oniony. But you do want to have uh, some kind of a shredded vegetable in there. You can certainly use yellow summer squash for this. Uh, that's going to add a nice bit of moisture. It's going to help to... Uh, the way I like to vision it in my mind is kind of separate those kidney beans so they don't get all so mushy. Uh, give a little bit of texture to the burger and also add a little bit of nutrition. That's what you start off with. You're going to preheat your oven to 375 degrees. You're going to line a large rim baking pan with unbleached parchment paper. I do lightly coat the parchment paper with some olive oil. Mm -hmm. And then put your kidney beans, your ketchup, one and a half tablespoons of the oil, salt, your smoked paprika, and your salt into a medium-sized bowl. Mash it all together using a mash potato masher or a large fork. And you want to kind of mash up the beans until they're almost completely mashed. You're still going to see a couple of whole beans because, once again, we're really looking for that texture. Fold in your fresh breadcrumbs, your rolled oats, your zucchini. Stir together. Form your burgers. I use a rounded one third cup. I use a one third cup measure and push it in there. You could do it with a half cup measure if you want. You really want to firmly pack it into the measuring cup. That also helps to hold the burgers together and drop it onto your lined pan, kind of shape it into a burger and flatten it a little bit. So it just looks like a regular burger and you're going to make a six burgers, tent it with foil and bake for 18 minutes, remove your foil, flip them over and bake uncovered for additional 10 to 20 minutes, depending on how golden brown you like them. And you want the insides to be nice and cooked as well. And just transfer them to a rack and let them cool 10 minutes and serve them just like a burger. And they're really, really good. 
Those are so good and they really hold together. It's amazing. You can just pick it right up and, you know, just bite it if you want it. <laughs> they hold together really well. And I think that the secret method is is truly that that bread secret that you shared. It really changed the game when I thought, oh, well, that made, when I first made the mushroom nut burgers, I thought, now that makes sense. <laughs> it really, really makes a nice burger. So great recipes. Thank and, you. Yeah. Thank um, you so much. So you have a husband, Andy, and how has his love and support helped you on your path being the jazzy vegetarian and, um, and on this public path? Well, his love and support in our marriage, of course, is most important, but um, mm -hmm. it's his technical ability. He's the director, the producer. He's the mastermind behind all of the technical of the program. He comes from um, being post-production audio supervisor at NBC Universal in New Jersey. So his background is really deep in television. So it's his expertise with the technical end of it uh, mixed with he also has a lot of creative vision and works on the creative as far as how the show is going to look with me. So it's really a partnership. And mm -hmm. that's how it that's how, that's how it happens. Couldn't do it without him. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's part of marriage too, a partnership. So that's great that you guys get to do that in your business life too. That's wonderful. So we think so. How are you staying active and healthy and happy during these really hard times right now that we're going through with the quarantine? Well, they are really hard times. Mm -hmm. And um, active, uh, I walk. Luckily, I have. 20 steps that go up and 20 steps that go down from one of my uh, levels in my house. So I use that as a stair stepper because I don't have a stair stepper, but I use that uh -huh. and do nice paths around my house to keep myself walking. And we do have a nice outdoor. So we get a lot of nice sun sitting on the back deck or on the grass in the back. So that's truly a blessing right now. Yeah. Uh, it's very, very challenging keeping my mind positive. I'm very fortunate to keep busy with the show and everything going on. So that really, really helps me keeping involved in something that I'm passionate about. Uh, getting creative with cooking, cooking from the pantry because we have really limited ingredients at many times. So I'm doing a lot of pantry cooking when we don't have fresh vegetables and coming up with some neat new recipes that I never would have come up with. So that's really, really cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, just trying to keep in contact with my friends through telephone, through uh, talking on the internet. But there's something that you said on the podcast that I would like to reflect that I thought was pretty genius and really spot on. I think that the most important thing is to find a passion, find something that you feel you can be involved with. And, you know, whether it's uh, finding a new hobby, whether it's uh, learning or reading, learning about something new on the internet, you can certainly order, you know, Kindle books, Nook books, and learn about something that perhaps you want to learn, you know, new information about bringing out the paints if you used to paint or, or if you like making jewelry or if you like to color or draw or if you like to create recipes, do what I'm doing. Get creative and start creating recipes with things that you have on hand. And that's kind of what keeps me going. But I will say it's really, really challenging, very stressful. And uh, I just try to take every day as it comes and keep myself as calm as possible. Yeah, we're kind of, we're doing the same thing, just one day at a time sometimes is, sometimes even that, it's like, don't think of the past or the future, just kind of be in the moment, <laughs> gotta just breathe, breathe through it, we'll be all right. Um, and wh what would you say is on the horizon for Jazzy Vegetarian coming up in the future? Can you tell, or is it hard to tell during these times, or do you have any plans, or, or what's on the horizon? Well, it's always hard to tell, you know, whether <laughs> sure. it's now or whether it's any time. You never know what's going to happen tomorrow. That's why I think more than ever, once again, you have to try and take today for the blessing that it is. That's mm -hmm. the most important thing for us to do in our lives in the past and, of course, more so now. Yeah. And I think I have to continue to convince myself of that, but that's really something that we really need to do. So that being said, 
every season of Jazzy Vegetarians always a challenge because once again we produce the shows ourselves and we rely on our underwriters and our sponsors to make the show happen. So we've got to go out each season and get our sponsors and get underwriters, find people that are willing to support the show. Mm-hmm. So um, that's what we're you know, going to be hopefully doing. And now it's more important than ever to have the show on public television. So we are hoping and praying that we are going to be able to film a new season yeah. this summer. We certainly have the resources. We're here in our house. Um, everything is automated. My husband is pretty much... a uh, genius with that the entire four cameras are except for the main camera and the camera he runs the other two cameras are completely three cameras are completely automated so Mm, there's what can all just be done yeah yeah it's it's pretty cool (laughs) and it's done in our kitchen and so it's something that we're ready to do want to do and we know i know it's more important than ever because i feel that that's my mission in life at this point is to entertain people, but to let them have the information of how they can make really tasty plant-powered food that's compassionate, mindful, uh, and something that we really need to do in the world right now. Yeah, well, good vibes, and I hope it, I hope it comes to fruition, and we can get the next, you know, you get the next season going. That's a, That'll be exciting you know, once it comes through. Yeah, me, I, I hope so, too, and I hope to write another book as well, and And uh, I just wish you the best. And I want to thank you so much for having me on your fabulous podcast today. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And for if you guys didn't catch the website before, it's jazzyvegetarian.com. And you can also check out jazzyvegetariantv.com. And you just redid your website and it looks beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thanks again for coming on. And I hope to have you on again in the future. Be well. Thank you so much, Krista.